All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our monthly Collab Lab Tech Talk. Um, and this month, I'm super excited to have Juan Andrade, um, who will be talking to us about uh, building design systems. Um, one more, uh, see, one more time, I'll just uh, mention stuff about uh, the muting. If you have a, uh, a question and, um, uh, or anything like that, uh, please just, you can raise your hand or throw something in the chat and I'll um, go ahead and unmute you. Uh, this is just due to some unfortunate uh, Zoom bombing by uh, people who obviously have a bit too much time on their hand. <laughs> but um, so these talks are recorded and they're posted to YouTube. Um, we'll make the links available on the meetup page, um, which there's a link right there uh, to, to check it out. And I'm assuming everyone knows where it is because you made it here. Yay. Um, we use live captioning um, using Zoom's closed caption feature. Um, this is super awesome and also awesomely funny sometimes in the mistakes. Um, we do have an abide by a code of conduct um, here at the Collab Lab. Um, so please, I encourage everyone to, to check that out and take a read. And if you have uh, the means or the time um, or however you could, um, you can consider sponsoring the Collab Lab. We are a volunteer nonprofit organization, uh, which helps to give uh, early career engineers some experience working on um, real, um, real projects, uh, focusing on collaboration skills. And uh, we always love uh, money or time, or however you'd like to, uh, to contribute and be involved, It'd be great. But with that, I will hand it off to Juan. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to start my share my screen. Yeah. Start the presentation. Can you see it now? Yeah, I can. Okay, cool. Okay, so uh, today. I'm going to talk about uh, building design systems. And I think that the main goal for this talk is to share uh, the things that I have learned uh, working on this field uh, over the years. And I would like to, to basically to present what I have been doing and what I enjoy of doing this. So first, uh, my name is Juan Andrade. I'm a front-end engineer at Khan Academy. I'm also a mentor at the Collab Lab. I have been involved in design systems for some years now. And even before that, before design systems were like that known or before those were uh, UI components, I have been working on that for a long time. Uh, so we are going to cover some topics. Uh, okay. so. The topics that we are going to cover first is the introduction. We are going to see what is a design system. Uh, then we are going to talk about uh, some goals that we I like to follow when building a design system. And then uh, at the end of the talk, we are going to move to a demo to inter an interactive presentation. So first, what it is a design system? I think that there are too many uh, definitions. So there is not like a single definition out there. If you, first, if you ask that question to anybody, so they will always give you a different answer. So I'm gonna try to explain what I can see and what I understand from other people that are known in the, in the industry. So this is one of the definitions. A design system is a set of interconnected patterns and shared practices coherently organized to serve the purpose of a digital product. So this comes from a book. It's really good, I recommend it. It's called Design Systems. And uh, what does that mean? 
Um, so if you see here, we mentioned interconnected patterns and also mentioned shared practices. So to me in that uh, regard, a design system, it's a set of different things that uh, cover this uh, product or this system. And these are usually called artifacts. So you will see from design tokens to UI libraries, to design libraries, theming, accessibility, documentation, people. So there are all sorts of artifacts that uh, are composed by the design system. And I'm not gonna talk about all of them, but maybe I'll, I'll try to cover some of them and the ones that I especially know about. That is mostly the coding part, and some of the shared, shared ones. Another uh, definition that I have seen from Nathan Curtis is a design system isn't a project. It's a product serving products. And again, what, what does that mean? Uh, sometimes we feel that a design system, it is a project that it starts and I don't know, it has a, a deadline like three, six minutes after you uh, finish that. Uh, in this case, design system is something that evolves, evolves over time. And, never ends because at the end, it's something that is evolving with your organization. So in that sense, it is a product, the design system that is serving other products. For example, the website, an application that you use, the mobile application for your company, uh, maybe a dashboard, uh, a blog, or any other kind of uh, products that you might have in, in your uh, organization. And everything is interconnected. And the idea is that the design system will help to uh, build all the other uh, products. So it's like part of the corp that helps like to work with everybody. Now we have artifacts and I want to mention something uh, about goals. Um, I think that this is also uh, called uh, design principles, but I feel that I, I like to call it uh, goals in, the, in this context because to me it is, a couple of things that I like that uh, to me, something that design systems should have or something that should uh, include since the beginning and something that I like to work with. So to me, I try to follow these goals in building design systems. One is collaboration, consistency, flexibility and adaptability, accessibility, quality and scalability. So there are too many goals, two different uh, principles, but again, I think that everyone has its own interpretation of that. So I want to give my ideas around these goals and how you can connect that to the design system. So first, collaboration. I think that one of the crucial parts in design systems is defining processes. Because at the end, as I mentioned, this is a product. So we need to define some guidelines around that. We need to find ways to work and work in a, in a way where we will know what we are going to be working, what our focus will be uh, to serve the company. So in the processes, we it's good to have a roadmap defined, to define a backlog, to have uh, guidelines from design to development, and sharing these uh, guidelines, I think that that helps to set a good baseline for starting the rest of the, of the work with the design systems. And there are too many other processes that you can, you can use. And I think that depends on the company and depend, depends, on, depends on the team and your needs. So it's something that it's always changing. changing. Another important part, uh, factor is people. I think that is the most important one to me. Uh, because this is collaboration. And as we are in the collab lab, I think that this is crucial for us. So that's why, that's why I think that design systems and collab lab goes fit very well. So as in collab lab, the same with people, I feel that some, something important in design systems is that uh, no matter if you are an engineer, a designer, someone from content, a product manager, the idea that we should be partners more than, uh, like uh, coworkers or more than someone is more important than anybody. It's like, we are all the same team. 
And even that we have different skill sets, we should work collaborative in, in a collaborative way. So we can we can create things like as a group. And to do that, I think that's some stuff that we have find in Ken Academy very helpful lately is that uh, we try to pair program, but also we try to pair design, like pair program design, I would say, because sometimes we pair program our code, but also we pair program, we pair about uh, some of the components, how we are going to design it from the coding perspective, from the UX perspective too. So I think that having different uh, ideas, different opinions that helps us to inform better how we want to build our uh, components that will be used in the design, in the design system. If you see in the right, uh, there is uh, an example of that. This is a fig jam. This is from a fig jam session that we had with the with the, uh, the designer in our team, and also with a mobile engineer. So we are, we were trying to discuss the best API to create one of the new components. And this was one, well, not a new component. This was one component that exists existed before in the uh, mobile implementation, in the mobile uh, library. So we wanted to port this over to uh, the web implementation. And also we wanted to include it in the Figma library. So we tried to uh, part from the initial implementation. We tried to also check how the designs could fit. And then we tried to find how that would fit in web. And then we, at the end, we found like a middle ground that would work for everybody. So that was super cool, and I, I think that helped to to continue to finish the the this project. This is this is like a mini project inside the design system. Uh, another important part is open communication. That means uh, usually you you talk in private channels in Slack. I think that for design systems, it's important to share everything that we try to to discuss and maybe some ideas in public channels so other people can be involved and other people can be aware of things that we are planning to do around the, the project and the product. And also another part important is to check with other teams to see what they, they their needs are. Uh, the second goal that I want to talk is consistency. And I think that this is super important for design systems because one of the objectives of the design system is that it looks and it works in, a, in, a, in the same way, no matter the platform that you are using or no matter the, the um, application or website that you are using. So it should feel consistent. So in order to be consistent, it's good to use this artifact that is called the, the inventory. It is a UI inventory or design inventory. I think that it works both ways. And you start <clears throat> from the uh, existing uh, website. Sometimes I think that this is a good in, you know, initial point. I feel, well, personally, I feel that sometimes we create design systems when everything is inconsistent and probably the product has been there for a long time. So sometimes you see a lot of inconsistencies in, in the website. In this case, this is from Ken Academy. So we had a, a text field component and we didn't have like one single uh, instance of that. So we had to go and run an audit over the website and try to find a different, so, uh, different uh, cases. So we tried to start creating the component based on that. And that helped, that helped us to estimate the work that we needed to do, how long it would take us, uh, which teams should we uh, talk with, because every part of the website uh, was well owned for, from different teams. So this is uh, something that helps to uh, start with that. Same with the uh, design. Another super important part is the uh, UI kit or design library. And this is the design part, I would say, of the UI component library. Uh, here you can see, um, this is an example that I, I created for this presentation. So I'm gonna show it in, in a moment, but uh, you can see that uh, you see some colors defined here on the on the right, and also a typo typography there. Uh, so the idea is to provide some consistency. So we create uh, some components and that uh, help us to, or designers and engineers 
to create some rules and to create some guides that uh, other teams can use from there. So basically, we are creating components that other designers can use in their own Figma files in the same way that uh, developers try to use uh, an NPM package. So this is like the same thing in Figma. We create the, the, the Figma library and then other uh, designers uh, get that library into their own uh, Figma files and then can, they can reuse these components that we create in the main one. This helps with that reusability, composability, all of that. Another important part that I, I think that it has gained a lot of traction during the last years, it is a concept called design tokens. So one way to uh, present a design token is um, design token is part of the design system. Is that like the smallest part in the design system? It is like a primitive to say that. So a design token can be a color, like a solid color, it can be a font size, it can be a, a font family, or it's basically describing a value, the smallest value that you can give to, to, the, to the design system. And that's shared across design and engineering. We have, I think that I, I have found that having two levels is good. I have explained that here, if you see in the example in the, in the, in the image. So the token is this, this color that you see on the top. Then you have something called a global or core token, that this is basically uh, one variable, one token that you are assigning this single value. That is the, the color value. And the idea is that this is like a, an internal uh, token or internal value that you shouldn't use directly to your components in Figma or React in this case, but that is the, like the stack that we use. Then it comes another category or another, another uh, level that is called uh, aliases or references. So the idea is that you define um, a token in a more semantic way. So the idea is that this reference uh, will take uh, a token, uh, a global token. So in this example, we have this primary button and the idea is that we are going to assign this, um, this variable to say this token. And at the end, this token, we can assign any color. Let's say that if we define it in our palette that, uh, that the primary button will be, let's say green. So then we will change the reference of this. This reference will keep the same. It will keep the same semantic name, but we will change the reference to this global token. It should be like a green 400 or something like that. So that's the idea around that. Uh, another, uh, subject it is important is flexibility and adaptability. I feel that uh, even that a design system must be consistent. Uh, if we are too rigid or too strict, uh, probably uh, our users won't want to use the, the design system. So it's important also to provide some flexibility for them to use that because if we are too tight, so, no one will want to use what we are trying to build. And for that, uh, this is another artifact that is payment that this goes attached to uh, design tokens. And this is the example that illustrates what I was talking about uh, global tokens and reference tokens. So uh, I'm not sure if the font is good enough, uh, but just in case, uh, and you will see that we have, this is like the secondary button there. This is the example. We have two global tokens, one that is blue and the other one that is gray. And we have one theme or one word like mode. This is like the, we usually use that as a default theme in a, in a website. So we have defined a reference token that has a semantic meaning for the border and for the text. Then we assign some values, and these are the values that we are assigning in the light mode. And then if we switch to the dark mode, 
So then what the only thing that we are doing is that we are changing the, the, the values, the core tokens that we assign to the, to the semantic ones. So in that case, we don't, have, we don't need to specify every time that we change a team, a team. So we don't need to rename the variables everywhere. We are just renaming everything in a centralized place that is where we define our theme that contains all the list that, of tokens that we use. I'm going to show that in the demo in a moment to give more sense of what I'm talking. But I wanted to first to point this out in a, like a graphical way. Also, uh, to be flexible, I think that is important to understand uh, or to try to use modularity uh, or how do you say that composability too? Uh, so basically the idea is uh, if you are building components or you are using creating this product, every time that you create a new, a new component, try to create it in a way that you think that you can reuse some of the existing ones or that you can create this component that could be used for future components in the system. So try to be like, it's like a, assembling a Lego, I would say. So try to create everything that can be connected uh, together and that can work together. So if you see in the, in the example on the top, uh, this is a, a card component that has a title as a string. It has a, a background color as a string. And then you are assigning a paragraph on HTML, like a normal one, and it has uh, add content. And that's it, that will render okay, the normal card with some contents. But if you apply modularity there, let's say that you have a, a heading and body or paragraph components, and you have some uh, variables defined in your, uh, in your design system. So then you, instead of using like regular strings, you can start extending this component card. You can, you can start composing it with other components that you created there. So for example, here you can use the heading, you just pass the, the same string, but now you wrap that in the, in the heading. So the good thing is that the heading that you define in your design system will have a set of rules and a set of definitions. So for example, you don't need to define the styles for that heading because at the end, the, heading component in our design system will have that design defined for us. So every time that we import and use this component, the idea that it will look and work the same way everywhere. So that's where composability comes into the equation. Something super important is that uh, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Sometimes you want to create everything from scratch. So try every time that you, if you need to create any component, try to look for what it is outside. So try to look for inspiration. There are a couple of websites, super cool, that every time that I have to create a new component, I try to go there and try to see how other teams try to build components, what variants they use, what properties they are trying to, to introduce, even how the documentation looks. So if you go to this website, component.gallery, so let's say you have the card component and you can check there. And these are all the, well, not all because there, there are tons. These are some examples of design systems that exist that include this component. You can even uh, filter by technology. So again, I'm using React. And then you can even uh, check by features. So it includes accessibility, yeah. For sure, because this is something that we would like, we should include. I'm gonna talk about that in a, in a moment. And then you click there, and that really directs you to the particular uh, page. So you can get more inf information out of everything, and you can use also that as, a, an, as an inspiration, as you see. And there are more examples there. Something uh, super important, and I think that uh, we try to teach this uh, at the Collab Lab, and I think that is also something that usually uh, we as uh, developers and designers don't pay enough attention. Uh, I think that we should do it more. 
And I mean, I think that personally, this is something that I learned at Ken Academy, is that we should uh, work with accessibility in mind, and especially in a design system. We, we are being, building uh, a library that our developers will use to build products that will be delivered to our users. We should bake in accessibility inside the library, meaning Figma and the, the component library that we use. So because if we do that, then every time that someone uses one of our components, everything should be, or most of that, most of everything should be solved for them and they don't won't need to, to reason about that. Well, what I mean, it's good to understand accessibility, but uh, it's also good to provide some primitives around that and provide some patterns that solve some of the cases that sometimes you miss. So for accessibility, something important, it is try to, if you need to build a component, try to go to this page, the area auto authoring practices page. That is where you, there are uh, all the widgets are defined. So if you have for some reason to, to create, um, I don't know, a menu or uh, an alert that is super common, they explain, what is the intention of the alert? How it should be used? The keyword interaction there. For example, like it says there is no keyword interaction. So that's good because that helps you to understand, okay, I have to create this component and I don't need to uh, to create any, to build any like key down like or any keyword related handling for the component. It should work like normally. So. And then you can go to an, an example there and you can see how it works. There are some other features and uh, they provide some information about which roles you should use, which attributes, area attributes you should use. So that helps you to understand how you should build the, the component in an accessible way. Then uh, another part is try using start and center patterns. And what I mean, if you see on the right, and this animation, uh, we, are, we have an in-house uh, birthday picker, as you see there. It is basically a custom uh, drop-down component. And then the idea that uh, you can click there and then select one item. But we noticed that there is an issue with that and is that people cannot operate that easily with the keyword, meaning that if you need to select a date, but then you have to focus on the element, press for example, arrow, then navigate with the keys, select what you need. And let's say that, for example, what, what if you are like a hundred years old? So you have to go all the way down. And if something that we are trying to do here is to uh, activate keyword and navigation there. So if you type in the, the year or the date, so then that will select the date or the closest date to that. And why we did that? And how we are doing that, basically we check the, the native select element and they do that. So we are trying to achieve the same result that, than the ones in the, in the standards. So that's what I say, try to use the standard patterns or try to follow the standards. And also have keyword in mind if it's needed, validate color contrast, contrast. And there are way more things that you have to take into account for that. Uh, you have to test also. You can do run manual testing. It is to use the browser, the mouse, the browser, the keyword. Uh, also, if you can try to use a, a screen reader, for example, if you use Mac, you can use VoiceOver. If you have Android, you can use TalkBack or, or Windows, it is NVDA. That is the, the open source one. And then you also have some automated tools for accessibility that also it's helpful because sometimes manual testing, you need some stuff. So similarly, like you do with code that you have unit tests, uh, you can also use uh, some tools to automate uh, the testing there. So, oh, sorry. So if you see there is a, in this example, we have a storybook and there is a, an add-on called accessibility. So you can see, this is the example of our component 
And here we can see the, if there are any warnings, any accessibility warnings there. And there are also some tools for guests and for unit testing. So you can use some custom matchers for, for that. I recommend about that, about all of these. This is an amazing workshop. This is uh, from Marcy Sutton. She is super expert and highly recommended about accessibility. I attended one of the workshops and it's really good. Uh, so I recommend to, to take a look into that. Another part is quality. Uh, so we need to deliver things that work well. So this is something that we, we learned that we do at Khan Academy. Uh, this is something that we call implementation spec. I'm not sure if it's used in other places, but the idea around this is that before we write any line of code, we should be thinking on how we can, we want to uh, define and design the API for, for any new component that we want to introduce. So this is basically, uh, let's say we, we want to create a card component. So we try to provide a description. We try to provide how the API would look like. We try to provide examples and some notes about the uh, implementation, meaning uh, development things that we have in mind, design, things in, it, in case we need to, to talk with the designers to see if there, there is something that we can improve and accessibility. So where we can start defining how accessible should be the components. Um, one important part is that we, uh, we share this with other people in the company. So this is like a, an open discussion. This is like not something set in stone, but it's most, mostly something like a, we try to provide this. So this is what we think on how we should build a component and people might have some ideas some suggestions. So we try to get to the best API and after we approve uh, how this should look. So then we start to implement the code about that component, not like after. So the idea is to have something solid and then try to, to work on the implementation because sometimes you can start or also working on the implementation and you get a lot of feedback in, when you create the code, when you create a pull request. So some stuff that could be discussed here, this is discussed at that point. So it is later in the process. So at this point, I think that is, it's, it's, it has helped us a lot because, because we can catch things that we couldn't catch at the beginning. Uh, and this is another artifact that is uh, the UI library or the component library. Uh, some recommendations. I don't want to go deep here because that would take a lot of time. And I think that uh, there are enough articles out there, but I feel that uh, for a UI library, uh, it's good to have uh, a good and robust API definition that is flexible and consistent. Flexible, uh, what, I, what I mentioned about modularity, providing some overrides if you need, but consistent meaning that, for example, if you create a prop, this is one example, uh, a prop for a card that has an state disabled. So if it's called disabled, try to use that disabled all over the place. So if there is another component that also has a disabled state, call it that way. So try to be consistent across all the components because when uh, the developers try to use these components, it's, it's easier where, when they are familiar with the API. Just try to be as consistent as you can. Also static types are super helpful in general in development, but also especially for, uh, com for developing components because at the end we, we provide some uh, APIs that can, they can reuse as you see in this example. This is the implementation of the component and this is someone trying to edit that component so they get some good intelligence there because of the way we are defining the types for that. And also they get uh, documentation around that and that helps to, to accelerate the development. So this is super important. For testing uh, the components locally, so you can use a storybook and it's super cool. And there are some other tools for testing like Jest, like a chromatic that is for visual testing and Xcore that is for accessibility. Hey Juan. Yeah. Um, I have uh, just one one thing. You, you've used uh, the word API a lot for the acronym yes. um, API a lot. And uh, I know when I first started, I heard API and I was always thinking about an API and a server that I hit. 
Um, yeah. Can you tell us what you mean here by API? Uh, yeah, sure. So, well, I guess that uh, it stands for application programming interface. I don't remember. I think you remember, but, but I think that's the case. So basically what we're trying to define with the API is to define the contract of the component. It is how it will work or how it will be composed. That is like the API. It is how the component will be named, how it will be exported, what we are going to export that will be publicly available for the, for the developers, what properties we are going to expose, how they are named, how, uh, uh, what are the types allowed for these props. So this is the basically the API in that regard. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, thanks for asking. Uh, so next part is reviewing the, cha the changes after we complete the, the functionality and we try to create the, send the code to GitHub. For example, we create a pull request. Something important is to try to automate, especially in our team. I think that, that we are a small team. So we need to try to automate as much as we can because that helps us to develop things and, and ship things faster. So for that, we are using uh, GitHub, GitHub Actions, as you see in the in this image on the right. So every time that we create a pull request, we are trying to uh, GitHub Actions, by the way, uh, this is uh, like their, the, the, the GitHub uh, service product for continuous integration. And that means that every time that we create, we create a pull request, we send code, uh, this will trigger some servers that will try to um, to run some actions in, in, in some like external servers. So what we do is that we send some code, we send our changes, then that will uh, trigger these actions. That is, for example, as you see here, we are triggering uh, unit tests. So we try to see if we uh, make some changes in a component. So we try to see that we didn't break any tests because sometimes when you de develop locally, you forget to run the test and something break, broke. So we try to make sure that this will continue working as we expect. Same for- we, uh, the, huh? Oh, sorry. Uh, there's a question in the chat asking what you mean by visual regression. Oh, yeah. So visual re regression testing is another word, another form of testing that is basically in unit testing, usually you are testing the logic or something that is not, well, you are testing UI, but you are testing logic. In visual re regression testing, you are testing uh, a snapshot or a screenshot of the, the, the component that you are building, of the piece of code that you are building. So the visual regression, what it does is that you create a functionality. Let's say you, you create, create a card. So that's the baseline. So that's the first snapshot or screenshot that you take. Then, okay, there is, this is new. There, is, there are no changes. In visual regression, in the next commit, let's say that you made some changes. And if there are some changes compared with the initial screenshot, so then it will try to compare both. And it will try to see, to see if there is any changes. So that it will inform the developer that take hey, something changed make sure that you are not breaking, breaking anything. So that's what it does. It tries to see that you don't, you don't inject box in the, in the code or if you injected a change, it, it makes sense. So it is intended. Also, we try to automate documentation. So we, we use Storybook. And every time that we, uh, we created the pull request that also spins up uh, a Storybook instance with our changes. And we are using Chromatic for that too. I'm gonna to show, show, uh, show that in a, in a moment. I hope if I have time. Uh, and then um, the next part, the last part that is important is release. So in the UI component library, something that we also do, and I think that is a common pattern, is that we export our components as uh, the serial tool uh, and as NPM packages. So because we need to uh, find a way to, to distribute this to different teams. So they can download this as a dependency and they can install it in their projects and they can use our components. So this is a, what it means with release. So basically every time that we uh, 
we merge something or we complete uh, a feature about a component. So this will be released automatically uh, to NPM. So then users can uh, basically uh, uh, download the, the changes. And we don't have to, to do too much about that. Uh, documentation, it is important. Even for example, in development, even that we, sometimes we only focus on testing things that work fine. Also, it's it's really good practice to also include uh, how a component works, provide some examples, provide, again, if you see it up, this is the API definition. This is what I mean. This is the table where we are describing the props that are allowed. This is the description and this is interactive. So you can, you can work with that. And I think this, comes from when we started with the implementation spec. So in the implementation spec, we define that, then we write that in code, and then we see that again in the, in the documentation. I'm gonna show that in a moment. And the last one also is scalability, because at the end we can create something, but we need to make sure that the thing will, will grow fine over time. Because, uh, you start with something and you need to make sure that this will work. Let's say that you need to add more components, you need to make changes, you need to uh, change the release, something. So you need to prepare for that. Sometimes you, you optimize prematurely, but I think that uh, you should think some, you, you should define some architecture, uh, initial architecture to, to keep things like controlled in a, and in a way that can scale uh, well. So about this, uh, this is a way on how you can structure, structure your, your project, your repository. This is for the UI component library. Uh, there are two common uh, ways of doing this. At Ken Academy, we use the one on the right that is called monorepo. So if you see in the middle, this is the repository, let's say that is called DS. So you have, Every uh, folder here, it is a different uh, package. It could be different components, but this is a package that will be then published to NPM. So uh, in the monorepo, everything is in the same repository and every package here is released as a separate package to NPM. I'm gonna show that in a moment too. And something that we, we found that was super helpful for us is that this helps us to introduce changes uh, incrementally. So basically it helps us to start making changes and, and doing migrations more easily. And also it helps us to understand better the changes for every package because uh, in the opposite, in the other case, the monolith, that is basically, it's the same repository, but instead of uh, releasing multiple packages, you are only releasing one package that is the single design system component library package, and that's it. So it's harder to, to keep reference of all the changes of all the packages because when that start growing, it starts growing. So it is hard to sometimes to keep with the what you are trying to do. And if you see this here, these are the versions. This is the number 130. So uh, we use something called sem semantic release. And that is, uh, this is, for example, the card component. Uh, this means that uh, when we make a, a change that is breaking the API, so it's changing the contract. So this number on the, on the left changes, it increments by one, that is, this is a major change. The second one, for example, 2313, is that we are introducing a new feature. And the last one on the right, it is a patch. It means it, usually it is a bug fix. So if you see this this way in the monorepo, uh, you can easily see if you are making changes only to the cart, it's easier to see uh, how the version will increment. In the opposite, if you do it in the monolith, it will be harder to keep that in control because at some point, let's say that you have to modify three packages, three components at the same time. So it is harder to calculate when it is a, a major, minor, or a patch change. And I think that the last part here is people. Again, I wanted to finish 
with this. I think that people are like the center of everything. So every time that you try to release new changes, it is good to communicate that you are releasing some changes. Make sure that people understand what they are trying to use. If we make new components, if we fix some stuff there, uh, we try to automate these too. So we are using a GitHub action to uh, send a message to our Slack channel. And then we notify that some packages uh, have been published with new versions. Uh, again, it's good to circle back with teams to see how they like the components. If there are some inconsistencies, some uh, use cases that we that we missed, so that is for that is important to provide ways to to accept feedback and to be open to understand that even that you try to do your best, sometimes things don't go that way. So it is good to be always open and try to be receptive to what people think about because at the end. You are building the thing, but uh, other people are using that. So it's good to, to get that external context and have a different point of view on how you might miss something. So that's important to be completely open about things that could happen and or communicate. I think that I try to communicate in the, in the channels, maybe an email, if you use emails, try to uh, join guild meetings and try to communicate changes uh, and so on. So that's super important to keep every, everyone in the loop. So yeah, that's what I have about the presentation. Uh, does anyone has any questions before I jump into the interactive session? Yes. Okay, um, going to... Okay, Carlos has a question. Uh, yes. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Yep. All right. I was just wondering for, for the monolith. I don't know if you could go back to that slide. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so I just want to make sure I understood it right. So for monolith, if like, let's say a card had a major version change, you have to change the major version for the entire package. Yep. Okay. So yeah, the design system package will increase one major version. So sometimes you make a major change to the card. And then the, the design system package will be like in number 41 or something like that. It'll get huge, yes. Yep. All right, thank you. Okay. And I have a related question. Um, so if we have a composition where uh, you're maybe making a card that includes a button at the bottom, um, yep. how, do you, how do you deal with um, the version, the versions to make sure that we don't have, I guess, multiple versions uh, just to yep. get something worked. Yeah. Okay, glad you asked. So I think that I, I can answer that uh, that question in code. So maybe I can I can show the 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 demo part, and I think I can show you that that example. Cool. So if you go, okay, I think that I'm gonna open my browser here. It's easy. I'm using is it here, maybe. Yeah, so I'm using a storybook for, for this. Uh, this is something that I was check, uh, I was mentioning about uh, accessibility. You're trying to check color contrast. So if you see, these are tokens. These are the global tokens. So we have different colors that I just created just for demo purposes. So don't pay attention, special attention to the color codes. So if you see here, I'm trying to uh, calculate the contrast ratio and automatically see how the dark color, the dark text color works there. And at, up to a point where it doesn't work, so then I switch to white. So that way we can inform the users for this background, you should use this color instead because if not, accessibility will fail. And some people might not see that. So something cool about Storybook that they have these filters so you can test how colors would look for different people so this is important also to define your uh, color palettes try to provide a, a good like middle point because sometimes it's hard to to keep to keep everything working for everyone but we have to try to do our best um 
So our tokens, these are again global tokens. This is spacing. This is the font sizes that we use in the in the design system. This is the typography and the line heights that we have that are, that are in purple here. Then we have the card component here. This is your question, right? Yeah. So uh, if we go to the code, oh, I have to minimize this. Uh, we for this we don't have a button yet, but uh, let's say that we have in the cart. We for now we have a package called. We have three packages right now. Uh, here, so again this is a monorepo, so I'm using npm for that. It worked for this case, so we have the cart component, and this cart folder will have a package that JSON that is independent from the root one, from the main one. And here we are treating, um, where is it? So for this, for the card, we are using, you see here, we are using theme. That is one of the other packages defined here. Let's say that this is button. So you see here, theme. And it's defined here and you have another package. So you get your version from here. So then you say, okay, I'm using thing here. So then I'm going to install uh, the thing in the card components. I'm using npm for that. I'm using this command. So it's installing it inside the package inside uh, the card uh, directory. So you will notice that now this is installed here. So this will work locally and it gets the, the current version from the package defined in, in theme. So let's say that, okay, we have that. Now we have to make a change in the, in the theme. Let's say that we change. Okay, let's see what's going on here. Okay, so if you see this card, it looks that it doesn't have enough color contrast. I had this accessibility add-on here, but for some reason it failed. I'm using uh, vid.js. I'm experimenting with the storybook there. So it failed, it happens in demos, you know. So I'm gonna use the contrast checker from, from DevTools. So I'm clicking here in the color. Is the font good enough? Maybe. Okay, so you will see this is the, the, the color of the text that is this black but the, the background is, is some blue. So you will see that this is failing. So we need to fix that. So for that, we can go to where we define the styles and this is the card. And then we have to change the color. No, maybe let's change the background. So instead of the, this is a reference token that this is what I was mentioning. So, uh, let's change this. This is a contract too. So this follows like an API. So I'm gonna change this with the body background that it should be the, the white one. So if you see this, now it changes and this should be fine now. So now you check the color contrast and yes, it is passing. You'll see this here. And we made this change, right? So. What else did I change? Okay, let's see. So I made some changes. So I'm gonna add the changes. So for this, I'm using something called change sets. That is the package that helps me with the releases. So that's but it helps me to automate versioning. So I don't have to pay attention to that. So this runs a command called npm, npx chain set. So if you are in a, in, a, in a particular branch, it will try to detect first all the, brand, all, all the packages that you have in your repository, because this is a monorepo. You will notice here that we have a card, we have theme and we have typography. So this will say, okay, you changed something in cart. So do you want to introduce any change there? 
Yes, so I'm gonna select only card. Was this a major bump? Is this a, a breaking change? No, I only changed uh, style. So the, the API is the same, remains the same for the card. So no, I'm gonna skip this. Is it a minor bump? No, it was a fix. So, okay, it will be a patch. So if you see card right now is 0.1.1. So fixing color contrast. Okay, that's it. Yes. So this change sets creates a, a, a file that is the one that associates internally. So we don't need to worry about that. But if you see that here, this is basically saying for this package, increment a patch version. And this is the description for that. So And then I'm gonna create the pull request. Why pull request? Because in this case, I'm using the actions. So I want to show you how that works. Uh, create. So then you go GitHub, you will get your uh, new pull request. And you will see that, oh, there is a change. So this is change set. Mm. Trying to detect the changes that you introduced in the command line. Okay, so for cart, I'm introducing a patch version. And there are some checks. So related to visual regression, uh, we are using a tool called Chromatic. So if you see, this is an external service, that is this. Uh, so uh, what I mentioned is that they compare the visual results from the baseline to the, to the new changes that we are introducing. So if you see in the, in the pull request, you will notice that we are changing this value here. And that's basically the change. So what we are doing here, if you go here and see this is running, you can click on details. This is a public repository, so you can you can see that. The link, oh, I can share the link. Uh, where the chat? Uh, so what it's doing is that it's communicating with Chromatic. I created a project for that. So it will try to, this is using Storybook. So any example that I'm adding, in this case, this is a story. So a chromatic will try to uh, send this, take a snapshot of this example and send it to chromatic. That is like a, the, this external uh, cloud service. So you will see this is started. Okay, so first this created a new storybook instance that you can access. Uh, so this was created from the pull request. So if you, if you click uh, in that link, you will be able to see this, this particular set of changes for this pull request. And if you click in cart, you will see the fixed version now. So it is associated to your pull request. And now this works. And the next part is that this finished. So if you go back to the pull request, so this check, I don't know why it is not updating, but this check, now it's saying, okay, this chromatic run finished. Check what happened with the, with the visual regression testing. So if you go there, this is chromatic and it says, hey, there is a new change, go review that. So this help this, I don't review this, but this is someone else that is the, the same person that is reviewing my code changes should be reviewing these two. So if you see here, you will see, okay, this was wrong. And now I'm changing to this. So, okay, it looks right. It looks as expected, or maybe something is going wrong. I'm gonna try to come in to mention someone. But to me, you can deny the, the change. So to me, that looks right. So I'm gonna accept it. So the build is accepted. So if you go back to the pull request, here. 
Now it passed and now it's ready to be merged. So I'm gonna merge it from here. Refer to a squash and merge. Yes. And now you remember uh, chain sets there so that I'm introducing a patch version. So this pull request is now integrated in the, in the main branch. So it is there. So if you see, okay, this is now there. And now the next, pro the next part of the process is to release the package. So for that, we have a release workflow. This is something that runs uh, automatically. Uh, yes, it is. It pulls directly from Chromatic, from Storybook. So basically, uh, when you go to Chromatic, you create a new project that is associated to your repository. Uh, and then in the in the repository in GitHub, you have to set up uh, like the key that is associated to the Chromatic repository. So that way it can match the, the repository with the Chromatic project that you have defined. So if you see here, this is running. Sorry that we are running a bit out of time, but this will finish very soon. So what this does is that we, try, we are trying to introduce a change. So this is change sets. And uh, you will notice that, hey, there are some changes here. So what does this do? Sorry that this is too much information for all this little time, but chain sets automatically creates this pull request. And here you can see, okay, for the cart, we are introducing this change. This is a path change. So that means that the package will be upgraded to this version automatically. How do we do that? Let's say that we create a separate pull request. We include some changes. It can be for a different package. We uh, do the whole process for the pull request. It is merged into main. And then if there is a change uh, in, the, in the packages, so that will be included in this same pull request. So when we are sure that everything is correct, so we proceed with the release. And for the release, I'm gonna show you this. So we have the packages there. So there should be a card. So we are in version 0.1.1. And then we are trying to introduce 0.1.2. And then you hit squash and merge. And that's it. And that's how you uh, publish the packages to, to NPM. So it will take a moment. You can see that there. This is running another action. Now that the PR is merged, this will publish the changes to NPM. It will take a moment, but when this is done, the package should be updated here. That is this one. I'm going to paste it there. So you will notice that at some point, the new version will be installed. This time it took longer. So let's give it one minute, 30 second, seconds, and that will be it. Ah, uh, yeah, maybe, I don't know. This time I decided to experiment with a bit and a storybook. We use bit for development in the, like in the main repository. But for a storybook, we use like the default engine or the default bundler that is Webpack. And for this demo, I wanted to try out Git to see how it was working there. Still in the works. So yes, so if you see this finished and then you go here, this was published two hours, two hours ago. And sometimes it is cache. Let's see. A new window. Card, what is second pull request polish? Yeah, it should it should be there. 
Ah, you are kidding me. For some reason, NPM is not working fine, but if you go to the repository, you will notice that card now it is it has a new version 0.1.2 here and the, uh, the the code the comments that were included in the chain sets it will be also introduced in this change log file so you can see all the changes over time so that helps also developers to understand the changes over time for your all your components uh, yeah some something is going on but this should be updated okay I think we, we believe that it will, it'll happen. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, that's it. Sorry, it took more time than expected. No, the, this was great. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, we had, there was one uh, request for access to your slides. Um, and I was wondering, is it uh, maybe afterwards you can, um, if you're fine with it, uh, you can send them to me or a link uh, to them and I can put them in the meetup. Yeah, sure. That cool. cool. Yeah, of course. Awesome. Well, it was, this was great. Uh, I feel like I learned a lot. Um, and I'm, I feel uh, so everyone was better off for having having come. So thank you. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, with that, uh, this concludes our uh, tech talk. Um, it has been wonderful. And thanks again, Juan. Okay, thanks to you. All right. See you. Yes. Bye. See ya.